we saw your seat. It's a great seat. Yes. But perhaps it's not the best seat in the house, is it? No. What it's... initiative have Charlton got in store for their fans this season? Well, yeah, we, we, we value the fans a lot and obviously they should get the best seats. Um, and so this uh, year we have been doing, we'll be doing uh, something very unique in England. Uh, I don't think it's done before. We have a, a pitch uh, size sofa where the fans can uh, can watch a the sofa. game live. Yes, yes, yes. Very comfortable. And here comes the big reveal. If you don't believe me, there is the fan sofa. Fantastic. Katrine, if you can take a seat. And let's have a look at the view from here. It's magnificent. Wow. Yeah. Better than your seat, you say? Yes, much better. Uh, so we will do a competition, actually. So the, the idea is that, um, that fans uh, in the crowd will film fans in the crowd. There will be a song will be played. And the one who dances the most or is the most expressive right. will win a, a seat on the sofa. And I intend to really participate at that one as well. <laughs> We've had five managers in that time. Yes, that seems a little bit excessive by any standards. Excuse me? It seems excessive by any standards to go through five managers in two years. Yeah, but uh, nevertheless, they proved to be right, the right decision every time. Have they? Because okay. we improved all, always our, 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 our ranking and our results. And, and my proposition would be a unique kind of real football kind of um, fan experience uh, and see the hopefully the next stars of, of the of the Premier League which we will have a play um, for Charlton in the first team and then probably sell on to the Premier League. You're, you're uh, fans don't see themselves as customers right. uh, and so whenever I now get very friendly emails from fans they say get out of our club so it's not the, the shareholders club. Um, I think it's quite funny because they say they pay, obviously the ticketing system is one third of our revenue stream, um, but they, they go to their restaurants with their family every week and they go to the cinema, but if they're not satisfied with the, with the product, will they go and scream to the people in charge of it? No, they don't, but they do it with a football club and that's very weird because they feel a sense of ownership of a football club and that's a really difficult balance is how you try to engage with fans and make them incorporate into into the, some decisions of the club, but I, I think it's, it, it, I mean, in the end, the bill is paid by somebody else, so he should have the final say. I, I know not all the, those fans are, are represent the, the majority. It was only 2% of the people that were in the ground that were outside. <laughs> What's your relationship like with the fans? I know there was an incident on a, on a train. I have no, not a problem with the Charlton fans. I, I mean, uh, what the video of me, uh, which everybody saw, was obviously a very angry fan at a, at a certain point in time when, when things were not going very well. But on that train, there were most of them were in support of me. I still go to all the games by train, and I really enjoy my time with the fans on the train because I get to know a lot of the fans and I, I not, uh, get to know their concerns and what they want for the club.
because I think this is absolutely key to our future. We have got a good reputation for our academy, but I think one of our problems has been that we s we've had to sell too early because we've been under financial pressure. Uh, Carl Jenkinson for last year goes for a million pounds to Arsenal. That player is worth between five and ten million pounds one year later. And I think one of the key things which hopefully Roland's financial stability will bring us is that if we've got a good player, we will hold on to him. He will get the first team opportunities being at Charlton, which will be good for his career and good for his value. And if and when a major club wants to come in, reluctantly one has to accept. But I think what I will be really looking forward to is not being in a position where we have to sell our assets before they have realised either their full potential playing for us or their full potential in the transfer market. We made mistakes last year, we know it. Yeah. We had far too many managers. Carol Freyd stayed too long, which is probably the biggest mistake. I was disappointed with the treatment I got last year, yeah, considering what I tried to do for this club. Ronald, as you know, there's been a number of protests from fans at games against yourself. How have you reacted to that? Well, I fully understand, of course, that they must be feel uh, miserable like I do, and uh, they, they, they try to, to, to say, OK, something has to change in, in the right uh, way, and uh, I can tell them the message has uh, come true. <laughs> so it, uh, we are trying to do our best to, uh, to, go to, to correct things, and uh, we will continue to do so. But uh, with regard to the uh, situation with, with Katrin, huh? uh, I know, I know that uh, they know her very well in the meantime. I can tell the fans, huh? she is a, a fantastic lady. She has a very good heart. If she did hurt somebody, it was certainly not intentionally. She's not that kind of person. And uh, okay, in any case, uh, she did for the best. And she has a very, very, very big heart for the club. She really loves the club, like you do. Do you think you can rebuild your relationship with those fans? Well, I don't have quite a big relationship with the fans today because they don't really know me. And uh, in the beginning, when uh, we took over the club, uh, uh, I asked Richard Murray to become the president of the club to, uh, and to be, in fact, the person who could, with much better knowledge than I, huh, have a dialogue with uh, the fans. Uh, however, today, since the situation is extremely critical and uh, we we see that there is a problem now in terms of that relationship. I step in to, to help mm. and to, to try to solve the problem together with uh, all the fans and everybody with the management. Now, we did do a lot of things already huh? so uh, for the fans and in dialogue with the fans with regard to the, the uh, here in, in the stadium we did improvements uh, and we are d have discussion groups on, on, on many subjects and we have a constant dialogue. Many people ha have been working very hard the last few, well, uh, year or two huh, to improve that, but not enough yet. Huh? And so we have to improve further. <laughs> So you've really got nothing to say, nothing whatsoever, apart from a smug smirk. He must be paying you like well. Nothing to say. Off the field, real unrest. There were fans' protests uh, before and largely afterwards.
as we can see here on, on this footage on, on social media, do, do you have sympathy for the fans? I do. Um, obviously, I was there at the initial takeover, um, and it was only a matter of time before I, I moved on. There's been four managers since. And what I just don't understand with such a proud club like Charlton is where are they heading? What is the end game for the owner? I mean, he's never said to the fans, he's never really said to the players, I believe. Maybe he has privately, but I really don't understand exactly where they're heading. And obviously now there's unrest with the supporters. And that, I think, is the question that the fans are asking. Guy Luzon sacked at the end of October, still not properly being replaced. An interim manager is in there, no chief scout, no director of football. If you're a Charlton fan, what, what are you thinking? Well, what you would think is you, you'd look at the setup when they're in the Premier League. Um, it didn't go too well. I was fortunate enough to bring them back up, League mm. One champions. We started to get the club back to exactly where I felt the fans wanted to be. Um, the infrastructure was there. Um, there was plans for a training ground, which I believe are still going ahead. But the fans don't want that. What the fans want is a team that they go and see week in, week out, home and away, trying to progress, trying to actually get to somewhere which, you know, as everyone knows, that when you're in the championship, mm. you want to be in the Premier League. And I just feel they feel there's no direction. Um, good people, decent people, um, but they've lost a lot of very key people, not only on the playing staff, but also just the way the club's run. And now um, the fans, are they, you know, they're going to vote with their feet. They really will. And it'll only be a matter of time before they boycott games. As part of these protests today, uh, I think we're just going to see now the fans were, were chanting your name. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how that makes you feel. You, you're clearly just listening to you. You're very passionate about this, Greg. Well, it's, quite, it's quite a good timing that I'm here <laughs> hearing that. But, um, well, I mean, they, they obviously know it's a, it's, it's a club that's been a large part of my life, in my playing career, and also as a coach and a, and a manager. Um, Would you go back to try and sort this situation out? If they wanted you to? Um, possibly. Possibly. I've, would things have to be different? Well, I, I, I would say you cannot walk in having four managers in just over 18 months. And nothing's changed and actually it's deteriorating. You've got to look at the, the squad. You've got to look at the direction. You've got to have everything in place to have a go to try and get yourself back to the promised land, which, as everyone knows, is the Premier League. But what I could say to you is... Um, Jose Riga came in um, and the team were in the quarterfinals of the FA Cup but in the background it was almost, well, once this run ends I'll be leaving. We lost to Sheffield United, I left the next day. Riga came in, team stayed up, they're always going to stay up, always going to stay up. They're strong enough, good enough and, and great, they stayed up. And Riga left, Bob Peters came in from Belgium, he's managed one of his teams before, he left. Guy Luzon came in, he left. It can't keep carrying on. Mm. You know, and that's why the what, fans what is that, now... What, 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 is, what do you think their agenda or objectives are for, for Charlton? That's the, that's the question that I'd love to get an answer to because I cannot see what the end game is. If it's going to be Premier League, well, add some, some stability to the football club, whether that's in management or whether that's in a squad, a consistent group of players, because players are just coming in and going. What worries me for the fans is that it, he appears to be going nowhere. He, he looks like he's in for the long haul. He, he's very brazen about it. Yeah. You know, I've seen some of the stuff on the, some channel fans have sent me some stuff on YouTube and, and some of the clips of yeah. um, their protests. Yeah, they're not just that, but also the, the interviews that they've done on the stage with one of his uh, chief execs, a female. Oh, yeah, Catherine. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and it looks like they're there for the, the, the long haul. Um, yeah. They don't look like they're going anywhere. So it's a stalemate between the fans <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the owners. <sighs> yeah, yeah. I, I suppose in one way I can say I knew it was coming. But I can't be that clever and say I, I knew this was going to happen with the man manager. Oh, but absolutely Chris, not the thing I can never understand with, with business money investing in football clubs is the last thing they want to do is lose money. Yeah, it's, it's and, and beyond if they, me. If they treat a club like this, I mean, you look at Charlton at the moment, they're in the bottom three, they're gold mm. I think I'm right in saying it's the worst in the league. It's minus 30. In all four leagues. Is it all four leagues? Yeah. Okay, minus 32, I think. I yeah. saw it earlier on. Yeah. 
They're going to keep losing money unless yeah. they stop this problem. And if they sell the club, they'll lose money on how much they paid for it and so on. It's just a never-ending spiral downwards for them. Mm. So there must be... They're not stupid. You don't become a wealthy businessman by being stupid. There must be a part of... But football does this to owners. They, they can be successful businessmen. They go into football and their brains turn to mush. Because they think they, they can... They think they can run football clubs like business. Football, football clubs are unique businesses. Absolutely. They, they are run in different... They're... they're the, the, pay, the, the fans, of course, you know, it, it, well, they call them customers. customers. That's right, they call them customers, yeah. right? And yeah. that, in a very, in a very, if you want, you know, anyone that doesn't know what's going on at Charlton, they call the fans customers. That's That sums up how they see their running of a football club. It's yeah. not a shop, as someone put on YouTube, it's not a restaurant, but that's how they see it. And they don't, they don't, they don't grasp how important fans are, then they are the lifeblood to a football club. And they, they just don't, until they grasp that or understand that, this situa situation is not going to change. No, it's not going to change. They're only four points away from safety, so actually, they've still got a bit of time yeah. to rescue it. Five, their goal difference is that. Well, five, yeah, <laughs> you're right. It could be six. Yeah. <laughs> Minus <laughs> but there, there, there's a massive problem there, because if you buy into a club, like Man Manchester City, they bought into the club, I know it's the money wise is way beyond but they've bought into the club they've bought into what it means what main road meant blue moon they've bought into it and you have to do that you have to understand the psyche of that club and then go with it and bring your expertise bring it financially as well but buy into what the club's about I bet they don't know that the club formed a political party to get mm. back to the valley mm. but you should know that and know what it means to those supporters, they love that club. It is quite unique. And maybe I'm saying that because I've, I've been there four times. I keep going, leaving, coming back, leaving, would coming you, back. Would, but, you, would you go back? Um, if Rick walked out tomorrow and they phoned you up? That won't happen. If it did? It won't. And okay, it won't if he went on Saturday morning? <laughs> would you go back? I'm under? going Derby tomorrow, so uh, I can't go tomorrow. No, I'm, uh, if he stayed there, if, if Roland stayed there? Would you? He, he, no, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. What? Why haven't they hired a, a British manager? That That's beyond me. They could win the fans, a lot of the fans over, by doing that, by saying, you're actually employing someone who has knowledge of the league, not the players, coming yes. in and saying, OK, we'll, we'll just try well, and stay and we'll get it. The stats of foreign managers getting teams out of the championship is ridiculous. I think it's improved of late. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the, it's so difficult, a tough league anyway, whether you know it or not. But the British managers tend to get teams out of that division yeah. up into the. Yeah, they do. We're, we're going to talk more with Chris Powell just a moment, right? I know we haven't got long to talk now. Really, you need a couple of hours to talk about what's going on there. Um, I was present at the game against Middlesbrough. Um, a very strange atmosphere. I don't think it's, it's an atmosphere I've seen or, or been involved in for a long time. I was working for, for Sky and. To be honest to the players, uh, they've done very, very well on the backdrop of the protests. Now, whether you like protests or not, the fans feel they need to be heard. They feel as if the club haven't listened to them and they feel that the owners um, haven't really done themselves justice with what they're trying to do with the football club. In contrast to maybe the owners at Leicester City, who have embraced the city, embraced the club and the mentality of uh, the area and the football club and they've embraced it. Charlton, it's a, it's a real sad story because obviously I was, I was manager when I managed to get out of League One. It looks like uh, they're hurtling towards there. Uh, they've still got a chance, but it's not looking great. Um, but they win the game last week against a, a, a forlorn Middlesbrough team. And then they make the statement in the week, which I don't think any supporter could understand, um, and it quite clearly shows that there's no synergy between the owners, um, the higher management and the football fans, you know, and the fans are the most important ones. You need a team um, on the grass, you need an 11 that represents your club with pride um, and it hasn't happened too often for them this year. They're saying that the statement said that the, the actions of the fans on Sunday, is that, that's actually kind of harming the attempts to get chart out of trouble what, what do you make of that concept well clearly it doesn't because it's what happens on the pitch the 11 players or the 18 players that represent any given team on a Saturday or midweek or whenever the game is that's the most important thing because the results 
and the points won or, or, or lost um, sort of settle people's weeks. And the fans, they live for the Saturday. They live for seeing their team. They accept that their team may lose, but they accept their team losing with guts and with, with um, a, a passion to try and win a game. It, that hasn't happened too often this year at Charlton. And now... Um, it's clearly not harming them. It's harming the football club because I think the fans are saying, you're harming our football club. We don't see what your uh, ideas are for this club, how you're moving this club forward. And if you are, please tell us because ultimately they pay the money. I know money comes from TV and sponsorship, but you have a hardcore of fans who watch the games week in, week out. They give their hard-earned money to their football club and they would like to see something in return. They aren't, obviously understand won't win every game or win every league they're in, but it's just not happening at all. Can you see what can happen now? I mean, there, 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 are, there are suggestions that the club could be sold, that the owner appears in no mood to, 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 to sell the club. Is there a way forward or, or, or is it going to have to be a case of waiting for the summer for this to sort itself out or beyond? I really, really don't know what will happen. Um, and to be honest with you, I'm sure many, many thousands of, of Charlton fans would like that, that, that question to be answered. The only person who can answer that question is Roland de Chalet, but he hasn't. And I think it's right for him to say, actually, this is my plan for your football club. I own your football club. You guys and the, the, the Belgians have called them customers, which is quite clearly the wrong... Quite, and that... that See, moments like that, for me, just really underplay and undermine supporters who hand over their season ticket money, who travel through the night to go and watch their team. You know, they're fans. They have an emotional attachment to that club. And they're not in it for the money. They're not always in it for the glamour um, because it's their team. And they want answers, and quite clearly, they're not getting them. Well, it's going to be a very long road for Charlton as a football club, for their supporters. Um, because if you are a supporter of that club, you're not getting any answers for what's happening, what the future holds. And now they're in League One. Been through it before. As you mentioned, I was lucky enough to be the manager at the time. It takes some rebuilding. But they have to rebuild the trust of the fans now. That's the big thing. And I can't see how they're going to do that. There's been talk this week about Paul Elliott maybe fronting a consortium. Right. Um, the Chatelet has been there because so Jose Riga has said it. Who knows? I mean, he, he doesn't say anything to anyone. Well, so do you know? What, what's he no, doing? I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no one knows. All they've seen is a team that has been dismantled. They've seen the spirit of the club lost. And that club, and Chris knows, we, we were players together at the time. That club is built on that spirit. And it's totally gone. So now, where do they go? Is there a will from the supporters to build bridges with this ownership? I don't think so. Um, of course, I can't speak for them all, but just looking at and speaking to fans and, and people I know, um, they just feel it's gone too far. They don't see any hope. They don't see that players are being brought through. They're not seeing a, a team that actually looks like it's going to be at least a, a, a mainstay in the championship and then possibly building onto that. They need to get momentum again. But they're getting momentum, all right, but it's the wrong way. But one thing moment. that might help, possibly, is a bit of consistency in, in terms of managers. <laughs> because the turnover, as you can see, is, is pretty high. It is. I mean, I obviously had two months initially um, at, the, uh, at the first takeover. And you then... fared quite well in that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then a number of managers, you need stability. If you mm. look at someone like Southampton, who went down to League One and made sure they got the momentum, built the club, got themselves back to the Premier League. Leicester City, they'd done it, a takeover, but they kept Nigel Pearson because they recognised that the club, there was synergy between the supporters yeah. and, the, and the management. They've got up and now, obviously, they're on the verge of doing something great. Charlton are going completely the other way and we've seen it with Portsmouth, we've seen it with Blackpool, and now you've seen it with Charlton. didn't the owners of Charlton come out and say they're, they're not, they're customers. And, yes. and that's where the whole thing 
started to snowball out of control. And once you make that move as an owner, I, I, I think it's untenable where they're at. And I've said to you in the past, it's not going to change. Whatever league, whatever manager they bring in, whatever recruitment officer they bring in, whether it starts to get better on the pitch or not, I don't think the Charlton supporters will ever forgive these owners for how they've treated them as supporters. And you've said just there, you know, whether it's 23 or 230, went up to Bolton and yep. watched the, one of the worst games by all accounts that's been in championship football. They went because Charlton's in their blood. And, to be, and for it to be described as a customer, I, think, I don't think you can repair that relationship. There's a complete and utter split. We, we, I don't think there's going to be many season ticket holders. I don't know how many are going to turn up on the day next season, but the fan base is, uh, is dropping rapidly. I just think it's a guy that's taken over a football club. He has got so much money that it's irrelevant what he loses. It's when he gets bored, Phil, or, you know, at some point it's got to sit in his head that this isn't working. It's failed. It's not going to turn around. Um, it's just how long he wants to carry it on. How stubborn is Roland de Chatelet going to be? Because... These fans will never, ever change their opinion of the regime as it sits now. So no. when you've got to that point, as an owner, why would you carry on? That's the only question I'd ask. Why would you want to carry on? Running a team as he is, is not going to... I mean, why is he running the team? Why has he bought the football club? I just, I can't get my head around why somebody would invest in a football club and run it the way he is. They've lost championship status and then... It's, from the outside looking in without knowing how all the finance works at the football club, doesn't look like they're even interested in putting a side together to get back out of League One. No. What's the point in running a football club? And all, get all too often, I think, Steve, that we've, we've discussed, haven't we, throughout the season with the way that the campaign has gone for, for Charlton um, and, and, and their travails, their difficulties, uh, that the lack of clarity mm. from, from the owners for, for their beloved supporters. Well, that, that's nice. something that any set of supporters don't deserve. And, you know, there's so many clubs that have, some of our London clubs especially, that have been really poorly mismanaged and it's cost them enormously. And exactly like you say, I do think their support will dwindle. Now they're going to be a League One club. And I do think that that will affect the budget. And I do think they're not going to have a huge deep squad to be able to make a significant challenge again to get re-promoted back to the championship next season you know what direction are they going when they were a model like I've seen Swansea here they've been a model of how you get to the top flight and how you stay in it Steve you were a part with mm. Alan Kerbisi of those tremendous times at Charlton at that football club they were almost everybody's second favorite team because of the journey that they come on returning to the valley and they've lost all of those principles and traditions, and it's such a terrible shame. It really is. Yeah. And so I who would take the job, though? Who would take the managerial job? Because, as you say, it's a, it seems like an almost impossible job. Well, Phil, uh, have you seen the article in The Times where Chris Powell quotes today? If you was an English... Well, no, any manager, forget what, what nationality you are, any manager reading that... And the, the snippet that I mm. couldn't believe was when Chris Powell went in with his, uh, this is a target I need, I need a left sider, we're, we're a bit short on the left side. And the owner said, don't worry, we've got that covered. Four days later, a left winger turns up at the training ground unannounced. They put him in a training session and Chris Powell says, he's not even good enough for my under 18s, let alone a championship campaign. Yeah. Who would want to manage that? If you're reading, if you read the whole article, and you're yeah. sat there and you're trying to progress your career as a manager in this country, who would want to go manage it when an owner sends substandard players to you in place of the targets that you have? And then all the other stories that go with it, Phil, about yeah. you need to pick this player, you need to pick that player, he's one we brought in from, the, you know, from across Europe, you have to give him a game, I don't want to play him, he's not good enough. And yet you're forced to play him or you lose your job. What kind of... Who would want to take that job, Phil? Uh, listen... Uh, even a struggling manager that hasn't had a job for a while, I'm not even sure that's a great move for a manager that hasn't no. had a job for a while, because you're going to lose it yeah. straight away, and it just goes against you again on your CV. They yeah. are in an absolute mess. They haven't even got a chief scout, Phil. How do, you, how do you get a squad together when you haven't even got a chief scout? You should be nominating your targets now and going for them. They haven't yeah, even got a, a disgrace, man in place. Isn't it? It's a disgrace, it, it, to, be, to be perfectly honest, that, that, a, that a football club, as Bradley was saying, that was the, 
the epitome of how to, how to run a football club properly ten, 10 years or so ago is in the state that it is in now, that it's been allowed to be, be in the state. And, and to be honest, I don't, personally, I don't think the fans have had enough support from the footballing bodies. Where are the Football League in this? Where on earth are the Football League? I mean, we know that they're pathetic and we know how they <laughs> let down the Wimbledon. No, we do. We know how they let down the, the football authorities, the Wimbledon fans. We know how the football authorities love their ivory towers and their suits and their executive tickets for big games. When it comes to big decisions, they shy away from them. We know that and we know that, that this happens all the time. Where are they now? Why aren't they supporting the supporters in this one, who are the lifeblood and the, and the heart and soul and the spirit? And the, the reason why Charlton exists is because of the support base. Where are those footballing authorities now? Hiding, hiding, cowardly. Well, I guess if no laws are being broken, what can they effectively do? But it's a principle, do? isn't it? Oh, it's a principle, I know, Steve. I know. I'm sat back here as gutted as anybody, and there's people that have supported that club from 50s, 60s, 70s, and they've seen... They've seen the club locked out of their own ground and they bounce back from time, you know, time and time again. But this one, it's not about, you know, the devastation of a, a relegation or anything like that. This no. is how the club's actually physically being run on a day to day basis. And all the generations and the history just seems to have been ignored by this owner. He seems a bit eccentric to me, you know, and he's made lots and lots of money. Good luck to him. But why, I, I always go back to this, Phil, why? Why would you buy a football yeah. club and do what you're doing to it? I just don't understand it. Yes, uh, I mean, we, we are planned as well in the communication. Uh, like any other championship club, uh, we get approached by uh, takeover proposals all the time, but the club is not for sale. Well, you can see why the fans are angry. The, the, you know, it's rumoured that um, they were willing to invest uh, quite a bit of money in, in, in the club, and sort of uh, the way things are going at the moment, you can see why the fans are angry. That you, you wouldn't well, even I, I think to we them. just established. Uh, we just established that the investment in the club the last past years, 25 million pounds, has never been bigger, uh, and 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 we feel we're investing in the right kind of uh, things, and 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 the club basically is not for sale. Does that mean that every investor gets treated the same way that Mr. Varney was treated? To to come. To go to the Varney stuff is, is if you read the emails that he's, he so kindly published, um, which were actually private and confidential and should have actually, with our permission, been published to, to just clarify this. Um, when he sent us an email, it specifically said, I would like to uh, discuss with you an investment proposal. Huh? Specifically, if we're going into the semantics and if my words are being treated uh, like in Dublin, where we can do the same way. So in the communication, it was never clear what his investment proposal was. It was only when it was published in the Sun magazine of the club. I read it on the website. Exactly. It, it, when it, the emails were published and he gave context to the emails that he had a proposal to take over the club. It wasn't clear at that point in time that it was it. And, and all of this to say is, that we get approached by people all the time, mm -hmm. and there's no matter in meeting with people if the club is not for sale. But uh, that, you just said um, that you weren't aware what the investment proposal was. <coughs> um, so to dismiss it as um, of something you're not you're not willing to entertain seems a little bit odd. I mean, wouldn't it have been wise just to find out? But we initially set up meetings, but due to his unavailability and my unavailability, we postponed, we postponed, and then uh, there were emails. Um, uh, that um, he wasn't happy with the, with the way things were going and then we just told off. Well, I made an approach to the club um, back on the 19th of August now, 2015, about a potential purchase of the club. I think a lot have been made about the words of investment purchase. I wouldn't mind explaining that. The, the issue now is, particularly with the latest television deal, that the financial power of clubs in the, in the Premier League and those being relegated into the Championship is huge.
So any deal has to be structured that there is an investment in the club, if that's the right phraseology, in order to make sure that you're increasing the, the revenue base of the club, because that's got very important implications for financial fair play. And then there is the purchase. But I think if I've actually written to the owner of the club, which is what I did on the 19th of August, and said that I'm prepared to come over to Brussels to talk to you about this potential investment, um, I think that I'm not going to do that for a 300 pound billboard. I'm going to do that because I've got a serious investment proposal to discuss with him. So I think some of the things that are being said about it could have been about, you know, buying a new lamp for the club or a, or a billboard or something like that is what is way, way, way off the mark. And of course, what subsequently happened is I contacted the owner again in January and said, look, the party is still keen, um, and I think there always will be interest because it's a London-based football club. I think there's, a, I think some, one of the things that's coming out is, I think there's perhaps a little bit of a misunderstanding about football fans in this country generally. Football fans do own the club. You know, it isn't like going to restaurants or cinemas or anything like that. They have an emotional attachment. It's their club. You know, they don't see themselves as customers. They see themselves as fans. And you cannot break into that emotional attachment. They often say that first game you ever get taken to becomes the club that you actually support. And, that, and that's so true. And I think once people feel that's under threat, whether it's at Leeds United or whether it's at Charlton or wherever else, then you have a very difficult job in, in, in persuading those fans to, to get behind the team because it, the whole thing becomes a sideshow um, and it's disruptive to the club. What you want is you want a stable club. You know, we go back to having the manager that's there for a period of time. You go back to there being a good feeling around the training ground, that fans are coming there with a smile on their face and thinking about only one thing, thing, which is cheering their team to victory. You start to eat into that and it all starts to become disruptive and protests and all the like. And it's not good for the club generally. It doesn't help the situation. And that's why this position has got to be resolved sooner rather than later. Well, I don't think they're only protesting just because the investors are around. The answer to your question is yes, the investor has an interest in a London club. Um, and I think I made that clear, that clear from the start. Um, because it's, uh, you know, as I say, business, business convenience reasons and because it's not that long ago, Charlton were a Premier League club. Um, and I think he's bought into the, to the, the proposition put to him that there is room for a club, a big club, south of the River Thames. Um, and I've been consistent even in the time I was at Charlton. I think that, you know, Charlton can be that club. And I think the fact it has a recent Premier League history means that people that are overseas looking at it regard Charlton as a Premier League club because that's, you know, that's how they've seen it over the last, the last two decades. So there's def definitely interest there, probably outside of, you know, the, the investor that I represent as well. But, you know, I have to accept that at the end of the day, if nobody wants a coffee, and just wants to hear a basic outline of what the proposal is. And I stress again that the investment part in the club is important because that income that comes in from new sponsorship deals and the like is what helps you to, 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 to deal with the financial fair play rules. And the money that some of these clubs are getting from the Premier League, uh, particularly in parachute money, clubs like Villa that may well come down into this league will have far more firepower than the Charlton are not getting that. So you've got to be creative and think of ways that you can make Charlton competitive again in the championship. Um, so yes, they're, they're around. Yes, they'd be prepared to meet, but I accept that you know, a meeting is not wanted. Um, well, that's, that's the frustration in not being able to sit down and have the conversation. You know, I don't think it'd be appropriate to throw figures, throw figures out here from the figures we've discussed. I'd like to think that you know, it would be a good deal for the owner and it would be a good deal for the football club. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get involved in this because I wanna buy two match day advertising boards around the pitch. That's not what I'm about. You know, I care about the club and I think it's, as I said to you before, I do believe it's got the potential to be that big club south of the River Thames, but with the deal the way it's going, a Premier League deal that's gone from five billion to eight billion, there is, I don't know whether urgency is the right word, but there is a need to get you know, to get to get the club, the club back on track um, and joining in that party that's at the very top of, of, of the English pyramid because the longer this goes on, it's going to be harder and harder for clubs like Charlton 
um, and many more in the championship to compete with the sort of money that's going to be coming down into that league from above. Listen, I mean, anybody that you know cares, cares passionately like that and, and are doing the things that they're doing, you have to admire because when, when fans have watched a game, for example, and they come round the back of a stand and they're prepared to stand there for an hour, I mean, that tells to me that they're genuine and passionate about their football club. Um, and, you know, it, it, that, comes out, that comes out loud and clear. Um, but at the end of the day, we all have to accept anybody that owns a football club in this country, whether it's Chilino at Leeds or whether it's Ronan du Chatelet at Charlton, if they don't want to sell, you know, they don't want to sell. Um, and that certainly is the message coming out, obviously. I'd hope that would have changed, but at the current time, it looks as though it's not going to. Roland might think again about selling the club. No, as we as we said in the in the past, uh, uh, the club is not for for sale, and we had uh, several approaches uh, from alleged buyers uh, before, uh, including the one of Mr. Varney. But somebody a proposal like that includes a move away uh, from the valley, and uh, Holland du Châtelet is uh, knows how important it is for fans uh, that the uh, Charlton plays at the valley. The comments are outrageous. Obviously, I wasn't at the press conference, but I had a number of journalists on to me today. And the inference is that by naming me personally, she's attached me to bids which allegedly involve moving away from the valley. In fact, I have had some dialogue with Roman du Châtelet directly. I didn't get past the club not being for sale. To suggest that any of this has been inferred from my direction, that the investor I have who's got any interest in moving the club away from the valley is totally disingenuous. Um, and I have written to Katri and Mayor this afternoon and asked her to retract that because she knows that that is not the case and I'm hoping that's what she'll do. So to be clear, Peter, the brief dialogue that you have had with Charlton hasn't had an opportunity to really outline what those plans would have been at this stage in the process. Now, I've offered now, I think on four occasions, to take the investor under confidentiality for obvious reasons on at least four, four occasions, the latest, which was roughly three to four weeks ago uh, was met with the fact that the club is not for sale so to suggest there's been any discussions um, about the club being moved or anything like that which would be ridiculous in the current position that the club finds itself the absolute priority uh, is to invest in the squad to get the club back out of league one and back into the championship and anything other than that is a complete distraction away there's no intention now and there's no intention in the future to move it away from what is a very well equipped stadium. It was a stadium that housed Premier League football for, for many years and the club doesn't need to be moved away. It's got far more issues to deal with than that. Okay. My first meeting with him and the previous owner, I sat there in the boardroom and thought, I don't think I'll be here too long. Why is that? Because straight away he said to me, you need a new goalkeeper. This is the first first meeting. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we're going through the the, the squad. Um, I knew that, that there was a network of clubs that he owned. Um, he's earned his money, and rightly so. In the business that he's done, has been very successful. No problem with that. But straight away, he was saying, "We've seen the players, and you need a new goalkeeper. Um, you need a, a, a striker better than Kamalgan, who's one of the best players I've ever managed." Um, you need a new fullback, and I, Chris Solly, uh, one of the best right backs, and Royce Wiggins. Um, and he just said, We've got players that will be better than them. I said, You've got to recognise and appreciate how tough the championship is. And then I had Roland saying to me, They're not good enough. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking. Have you had that before when an owner of a club has told you how to run it? No, 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 no. Owners are very, very important to clubs. They come in all shapes and sizes from all different backgrounds, primarily from they have businesses that they're very successful at, and they either love the club, like uh, the, the owner at, at Huddersfield, Dean, um, or they buy in and they want to do well and they ultimately want to get into the Premier League. Fine, no problem. They want to throw their money at it, and fair enough, they've been successful, they got the money to do it. But Roland straight away said to me, 
we need these players and that players. I said, well, as long as I've seen them, I know what they're about, and I have the characteristics and the character I feel is right for this club, because it's a bit of a one-off club, a bit special mm. with what they've been through, then fine. But then I'll go to training, I'll get a phone call, oh, there's a goalkeeper downstairs. And I'm thinking, well, I didn't know he was coming here. I had to go down and go, oh, good to see you, great. But I'm thinking, I don't know who you are. So all of a sudden, you have to play him. But then well, I've why got... do you have to play him? Because he wants them to play, because they've come over to play. They've obviously been told, it's yeah. never ever the player's fault. I used to Talk. say to the stuff, it's not their fault. They're playing in Belgium or they're playing in Hungary, and they've been told, go over to England, which they obviously feel is a great opportunity, yeah. you're going to play. Did Roland ever tell you to pick players, or ever tell you to pick a formation, or ever tell you to make substitutions? At yeah, not substitutions. But he told you um, to pick a certain player? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, and... A lot How of often did that happen? A lot of time I said no. But the other time, you said yes? No, I never ever said yes. I would always choose the team I felt was right for that game. If you... You get compromised. You cannot do that as a manager. You have to have belief in the players, the 11, the 18 that you choose. And it will work for you sometimes, and other times it won't. But for... Roland to say to me, after I've played a game and we, we, we lost the game, say... Why didn't you play him? Why didn't you? I'm saying, well, he's not up to speed. He's not good enough. He's not right for the championship. Now, at the time, it was quite a brave move, but I didn't want to compromise my own principles mm. um, because then I'm not manager of the team. Your um, situation's becoming un untenable here. Well, absolutely. So I knew. I knew straight away. Uh, over what period of time is this? I had two months. So January okay. came in. I left in March of 2014. And I just knew if... This is the way they're going to work. It will not work at this club, for sure. Watford have done it, but they've done it in a different way. They really have done it, and do they've been smart how they've done it. Do you think he had a hidden agenda? Do you think he wanted to get rid of you, so he got on your back? Well, yeah, because... Maybe he's... from day one? Possibly. Possibly. I, I, only he could answer that. And uh, for picking the team, it's uh, the owner is not involved. <laughs> but uh, the only thing that, that he has a say in, and it's quite rightly, is if uh, we go for a player, a transfer of a player, and there is really big money involved, obviously he needs to have a say in it. But that's it. That's it. And I think just to remove a myth, because I don't know who created it, but, but it developed its own steam about Roland picking the team for Chris and Chris not being happy, therefore walking out. That was not the case, I can tell you. What the owner did do, and maybe this did upset Chris, who knows? He did, uh, Chris would come back and say, yeah, we've lost again, or whatever. Uh, it's our need replacements. Roland would say, yeah, but what about these guys I've sent over? They're not bad. Why isn't he playing? Why isn't he playing? So, but anybody would question that. If you're picking up the wages and you've sent them over, whether they're good enough on, or not, you are going to ask. If Chris had been winning all those matches, it would have helped his argument, say, not good enough with me, I'm happy with my existing team. But he was really ringing up saying, I need reinforcements. We got reinforcements, probably not good enough, I accept that. And then Roland, of course, says, you lost again, you didn't pick my reinforcements, what's wrong with them? So it was that sort of question which I think, if you're winning, you can be robust in your answer. If you're losing, it becomes difficult. So I'm not saying Chris's life was easy, but Roland was not picking the team. He was questioning afterwards, well, didn't we win? <laughs> which all of us do. Um. Well, I think we do appreciate the investment that's coming on the academy and on the pitch, and that, that we've now got better owners than we had before. There's still a lot of concerns being raised about uh, Roland's influence on the team. We've had comments from Alex Dyer, um, from Bob Peters, and from, is it Redditch, the uh, Stanley Age coach, that he doesn't want a coach, he wants a, a puppet. Can you tell us more about these allegations that he's interfering in the selection of the team and telling the coaches which players to play? Well, well all the people that you named are ex-employees, to put it already to start with in perspective. Um, and like I said before, um, there are no puppets in this club, not at all. And um, we always try to work together. And uh, the manager or head coach is solely responsible for the team selection. I mean, that would be completely uh, mind-blowing if not. And um, the only thing that there is an influence from Belgium is when there is a lot of money involved in transfers. And that's it. And I think that's normal. And that's in every other club.
say that when Alex Dyer uh, put this interview, he was still on the contract with us, but he was aware that he was not taking on uh, getting a new role at the club. I'm not. I'm, I, I am not here to 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 bash on other people. It's not my style, and it will never be my style. Uh, uh, Bob Peters uh, chose to do an interview in South London Press. They called me for a reaction, but I just said, I don't feel like a reaction. It's not my style to, to, to comment on other people's comments. I will. Uh, they have their own version. Going back to uh, the, the, pl the playing side, um, when Chris Powell was dismissed, the uh, reasons given were that he was failing to agree with the club's footballing strategy, I think was the, uh, the, uh, one of the reasons I, uh, that I read. Um, he, sp he stated that uh, he was not happy with a situation where he was being, players were being sent over and he was being told to play them. Mm. And in particular, the, the goalkeeper who um, I think most people accept was perhaps, certainly at that stage in his career, wasn't good enough to be in the side. Mm -hmm. um, are you able to assure us that our current interim manager and uh, those that have come before and those that will presumably follow are not uh, subject to anything of the sort and are they allowed to pick the side without any interference from abroad or from anywhere else? No, I think it's a, it's a bit, uh, I mean, out of reality, this comment. Uh, obviously, whatever coach that came in was uh, in charge of its team. And, and is able to pick the players and, and uh, especially Mr. Duchatelet really recognizes the work, the most important work and the, the way you choose your team for the game on Saturday is based on what the manager sees during the week every day. They work with the players and I think we had some examples this week, uh, this se season as well. If the players don't perform uh, well during the week on a training, they might end up on the bench while everybody of the fans and, and maybe also Mr. Duchatelet would say why, did, why doesn't he start in, in, the, in the first 11. Um, so uh, I've been. I think there have been enough of examples like that, and um, and I can assure you that, that that's not the case. It, it's it's things like that which cause people to be unhappy, and it's good that you know if that isn't happening, that it's made very clear that it's not happening. It, it's it's for sure not <laughs> okay. not happening, and uh, I I always say to people is to put things into perspective what other people say in the press, uh, because it's mostly concerns ex employees that are dismissed. Uh, and so, at a certain point in time, you need to to realize that people might people might be saying certain things for certain reasons. Okay, but it's still good that that's clarified for everybody. How much say do you have in team matters? I don't have uh, any say at all. Huh? In a sense, uh, that is uh, clearly the responsibility of the in this case of Jose. Huh? Uh, why? Because uh, it's uh, he is responsible. How can you uh, uh, give responsibility to somebody and uh, make him accountable if he cannot uh, uh, choose his own players? That's impossible. When uh, we came here, obviously I was involved uh, a little bit more uh, and I also attended some discussions with uh, renewal of some players uh, with Catherine because it was officially new to her at that point in time as well. The fact, you know, it's a big thing to say you've made mistakes. Nobody likes to say they've made mistakes. It's not easy. Uh, it's not easy for, for my son, who's, you know, who's a teenager, to say, I've made a mistake, Dad. But people do make mistakes. And, and the important thing is we learn from those mistakes going forward. And, and I think there is a real intent to learn from those mistakes. And, you know, the, 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 they've done... They've made a start by appointing a British manager, which has not happened for a good number of years. Somebody that knows the, the league, knows the way around, knows contacts. I think. And so, if, if everybody, if, if we heard, if I want, you need to hold me responsible. And, I'm, and that's why I'm meeting you here now, and I'm trying to give you explanations for everything that happened, because ultimately I'm the responsible for this club.